I would like for us to turn to Luke chapter 23 this morning. Your Bible's Luke chapter 23. And if we could stand for the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 23, starting with verse 6. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him. Because he had heard many things about him, and he had hoped to see some miracle done by him. And he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. <clears throat> And the chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been enemies with each other. Father, bless your word. Speak to our hearts today. Before we ask him in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There are many crucial characters that we find in the Easter story. Um, we've looked at some of those in the past few weeks. We've looked at Caiaphas, and then there's Peter, and there's Pilate, and there's Judas, and there's a lot of others also. But Luke is the only one who mentions Herod. And that kind of puzzled me. Um, because I, I wouldn't, uh, you'd think Herod would be a key figure here. But I believe that when something or someone is mentioned in Scripture, it is not there by accident. I feel that it, uh, the, the same way uh, about Luke's account of Christ's encounter with Herod, that there's a reason that he mentions Herod. And looking at Herod, we can see traits that are observed in many Christians today. When Jesus came into contact with Herod, Luke gives us insight into what's going on. What, so what happened with Herod in this scripture? I want us to look at his reactions and find out because I think that's the key to learn from Herod. So when we look at Herod, the first thing I, I noticed about Herod, and it was one thing that just jumped off the page at me, was that Herod was looking for the spectacular. Herod wanted to show. He wanted it just as big as it could be. He wanted, he wanted to see something magic. One of, the, one of the commentaries I came across, one of the sources I came across said that, uh, that Herod was looking for a magic show, is what he was looking for. Now, you've got to understand with the background of Herod, Herod was not a man who did things in a small way. One source I came across put it this way, like his father, Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, who is the Herod mentioned here, was a builder of cities. He built Tiberias on the Lake of Galilee and other cities after Greek models. He was clearly enamored with Greco-Roman culture. Though much of his heritage was Jewish, his heart was Greek. And we see the inner struggle it created in him. Luke was earlier introduced to Herod back as far back as chapter 3 when he talked about the birth of Jesus. That is the time that Luke explains that John the Baptist also appeared on the scene in chapter 3. And after describing John's preaching, Luke then reports, But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. So during the time of, of John's baptism, during the time that Jesus came onto the ministry, Herod was already in power. He had already done big things. In fact, when, when he heard about Jesus and all the things that he was doing, he saw the chance for another show. For, so, one writer says, now from all indication in this passage, Herod seems excited to meet Jesus. The presupposition here is that Herod had heard about Jesus and what he had been doing. But we come to the conclusion that Herod's excitement was simply that Jesus would perform for him would perform for him. And I read that and I thought that the problem was that Jesus didn't come to perform to, but to provide salvation to the lost. 
everything he did was to that end. But unfortunately, many people today expect the same thing out of Jesus. They want to quote magic show. They expect their experience with Jesus to be some awe-inspiring miracle instead of some personal experience that touches their lives at a much deeper level. In other words, Herod, for many people of today, the, the message has become, what can do God do to serve my needs and interests instead of what can I do to serve God because I know that He will meet all my needs. Uh, the culture of this big performance has crept into the church world. It really has. And we get caught up in it. I mean, we like a show. We like it when, when things are big. We like it when, when you, you go into a place, and I mean, it's just, it's just all inspired. The music just, it, it just makes your skin tingle. And, and everything about it just seems like, oh, this is just so great. We like that. We like the show and the performance. And I think it's because we, we can get caught up in that and it really, we really don't have to do anything. We can really just enjoy it. In fact, that is what the consumer concept is all about. To give people what will draw them in. It really is. Uh, Bill Hybels, uh, in the past couple of years, he's the one who really was uh, really strong in starting what they call seeker sensitive. Uh, and he, he studied what people were, were looking about. In fact, he wrote the book, The Mind of Harry and Mary, Unchurched Harry and Mary. Uh, fabulous book. Talks about what people outside of the church are looking for inside the church. And, and he fashioned everything at Willow Creek around that. And he brought in thousands and thousands of people. I mean, they have pro their production up there of a service is just amazing. But in the past couple of years, Bill Hybels came out. And he said, you know, I've sold people short. I haven't given them what I should have given them. We were so consumed with bringing them in, with filling it up, basically, that we really didn't help them grow. We didn't give them anything that would take them further in their life. And he really regretted that. He, he really regretted that he didn't have that in place when he was doing all this stuff. Not that it wasn't wrong to bring the people in, but it was so focused on that performance. It was so focused on what everybody else wanted instead of really what God wanted. And that's, that's the key to everything. Now don't go away from here saying, uh, the preacher just said that, all this seeker sensitive stuff and all reason people outside of the church was wrong. I did not say that. But I, say, I do mean that when that's all there is to what we are doing in the church, then we are not being the church that Christ has put in place. And so that's what, uh, that's what Herod was like. He wanted Jesus to come and perform for him. But the Bible, that, the, that kind of concept just doesn't jive with what the Bible says. It, it's not the big that is important. It is the presence of God that makes the difference. Now, I, you know, preachers understand this because we will, we will go to meetings and we will meet with other churches and churches are doing these great things and we think, well, you know, what am I doing? What, why can't I do that kind of thing? And why can't I reach that kind of people? Why can't I have that kind of church? And we get caught up into the big. Instead of getting caught up into what God is doing. And that's where it's at. You know, it was in the Old Testament, 1 Kings, where it says in chapter 19, Then he said, Go out, stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there came an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, Still small. You know, sometimes I think we get so loud we can't hear the still small voice. If Herod had just gotten off his pedestal and listened, he could have seen in Jesus what he had been looking for. 
You see, God was in the smallest of things. And that's the way that He is even today. And many times we, it just passes us by. The little things that come in front of us. You know, Jesus said, you know, when you help one of the least of these, you're helping me. And we let that pass us by. When we're in a service and, and God is speaking to us and we feel a twinge, we, we think, oh, you know, that's, that's just something I had for breakfast. Okay? And we miss God speaking to us. When we have the right focus and the proper motives, then we're not going to miss God. We're not going to miss who He is and what He is to us. In 2 Corinthians 1.12, it says, For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. You notice the word simplicity? Godly sincerity? This simplicity didn't sit well with heaven. Because of this, he had a problem. See, not only was he looking for the spectacular, but Herod was not satisfied. He really wasn't. You see, Herod got upset when Jesus didn't perform miracles for him. And, and then to top it all off, Jesus didn't even, even respond to him. Have you ever talked to somebody and you got something to say to them and they won't even, they won't even respond to you? Oh, they'll stand there, they'll stand there stone faced but they won't respond to you? Parents know that. Some of you experience that. Boy, you just stand there. Oh, keep talking, but I'm not going to say nothing. And uh, that just got to hear. Herod was standing. He's a man of, he's a man of prestige. He's a man of standing. He is a king. And you're not going to respond to me. How dare you? He got mad. And and that happens often when God doesn't do the things the way we want Him to. We think it should be done a certain way, and and God says no. That's not the way it's supposed to be done. And, and God doesn't go with our plans. A lot of times what we do is we make the plans and then we ask God to bless them. Instead of going to God first and saying, okay, God, what plans do you have for me? What do you want me to do? You see, we really need to look at why we are doing the things that we are doing in the name of God. Why are we, why are we worshiping the way we are in the name of God? Why are we having church the way we are in the name of God? Why are we living our personal lives the way we do in the name of God? Why are we living our family lives the way we do in the name of God? What is the motive behind it? Because when we set up standards that are not according to God's will and to God's plan, the bottom line is we are never satisfied. If it's not according to God's will and God's plan, we are not satisfied. I do a lot of, of marital counseling, and, and one of the things, that, one of the issues that I talk to with them is the spiritual side of marriage. Because if at the beginning of the relationship, if we do not have the standards set down that God wants us to set down for that relationship, that relationship will not satisfy us. But if we have the relationship, if we have the standards set down that are according to God's plan for us, then we are satisfied with that relationship. See, the truth is revealed in Scripture in, in uh, Jude. Chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, it says, There are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by the winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Doesn't that make a good picture? When I just read that part about fruitless trees in late autumn, I just thought of the story of the boys with, with going out and getting the fruits and the vegetables late. <laughs> you go out and you see something and, and it's like going to, you see this perfect apple on the tree and you think, man, I love apples. And you go out and you want to find that apple. So you go to that apple and you, and you look up at that apple and you pick that apple and when you pick that apple, something kind of wiggles between your fingers. There's a big old worm in that apple. Well, that's not going to satisfy you. It's not going to satisfy you. And that's what it's like when we don't go against God's plan. It doesn't satisfy us. No matter how good it looks, it doesn't satisfy 
You know, there's so many people that are trying to live a godly life by the way of the world. And it doesn't work. We cannot do this the way the world does it. Because it doesn't. The way we do, the way we live the Christian life, the way we, we uh, do church, it does not make sense to the world. It does not make sense according to the world standards. The world standard says you need to be a success. You need to be on top. You need to be the one to be number one. And yet Scripture tells us that if you want to be first, you've got to be last. That you've got to think of others more than yourselves. And the strange thing is, that's what can satisfy us. That's what can make our lives better. When we go to God on His terms, then we find true satisfaction. Isaiah 58, 11 says, And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fall. I mean, it's just, it, it's just amazing to me that the, the Scripture says that God will satisfy us in places that would not normally be places where satisfaction could be found. <coughs> I listen, you know, we have these tragedies. We have tornadoes and stuff like that that go through places. And, and it just it amazes me to watch the people that they interview. And they'll find people. And, and uh, no, news people don't know how to handle this. We've talked about it in church before. But they'll go to talk to people and they'll say, well, you know, I've lost everything. But, but I still have my family and, and God still <clears throat> gives me. And it's just like, Wow. God's still good to me. I've lost everything. It's a scorched place that I'm in right now. It's a place that I don't have anything in right now. But God's still good to me. I still have God. And that is just what keeps us going. That is what satisfies us. That is what does not make sense to the world. But it makes sense to the person of God. We need to understand that God wants to make our lives fulfilling. He wants to make your lives good. He wants to give you good things. But that will only happen in one way. And I want to tell you, Herod missed out on a chance. Because he wanted to show uh, he was not satisfied. But Herod encountered the Savior. He really did. Herod was so into the world around him that he could not see what was right in front of him. Herod reveals the true shallowness of his heart. He was offended by Jesus. And he showed him no respect. And because of that, he plays the bully. And he goes in and he has Herod beaten. And he has uh, ridicules Herod. I mean, uh, has Jesus beaten and ridicules Jesus. And then he sends him back to Pilate. And from then on, him and Pilate are friends. Because you know evil likes company. He missed the Savior. Many people during that time, did the same thing. Even the disciples. The disciples didn't even know who Jesus really was until He rose from the dead. They had had Him for three and a half years. They didn't understand who He was. They didn't. Uh, Jesus told one of His disciples, I've been so long time with you and you still don't know who I am. The sad thing is that even though we have the revealed Word of God, right in front of us, Still, people can't see Jesus for who He really is. People can't see Jesus as the Savior. We need to see Jesus as our Savior. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. Oh my. We love that verse so much that it loses its impact. But just to realize that, that we have an eternal home, that there's something more than what this world has to offer. In fact, this verse gives us, all of us, hope. Even the Herods of the world. It gives them hope. This is everybody. Romans 5.8 says, God shows His love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't, he didn't, isn't it great that He didn't wait for us to get everything in order in order to make us right? He did it while we were sinners. He did it while we were still spitting in His face. We did it while, he, while we were still slapping Him. He, we did it while we were still crucifying Him. He still died for us. 
And I believe at that moment, I believe right there, if Herod had changed his mind, if Herod had said, I want to live for you, Christ would have accepted him. Acts 4.12 says, There is no, there is salvation in no one else, but there, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You see, until we see Jesus as our only hope, we have no hope. We've got to see Him as the only one. There are a lot around the world today that are trying to tell us there's more one way to heaven. But I want to tell you this morning, if you claim the name of Christ, there is only one way to heaven. <coughs> because we have it in the Word. We have it from God. That there is no other name by which we must be saved. There is no other name under, under heaven by which we can get there. That's what the message is all about. That's what the message of the Savior is all about. And Harry had every chance to follow Jesus, but he was just too stubborn and he was too selfish to open up to the Savior. He was so tied to the world that there was no room for the Word. I want to challenge you this morning. Don't be like Herod. Let Christ happen in your life today. Now, you may meet Him for the first time. Maybe, maybe you, you've never made that step. Then you need to make that step today. Or you may just want to re-energize your relationship with Him. You may say, I'm a Christian, I've been a Christian, but you know, I don't feel that closeness. You may need to do that. But whatever the case, don't miss the opportunity of this encounter with the Lord today. You're not here by accident. You have an encounter with God today. What you do with it is what's going to matter. Let Christ happen in your life today. I'd like for us to stand.